And without further ado, welcome. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And I have to tell you, um, there's all kinds of cliches, so I won't go there. I want to say brain trust, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing's for certain. This is not what we do in the field on tractors <laughs> yet. OK? So uh, first, at this end, is Mark Bittman has been a leading voice in global food culture and policy for more than three decades. He's written more than 20 books, including How to Cook Everything series, Food Matters, and his latest book, Animal Vegetable Junk. And since I'm addicted to showing books, <laughs> this is it. Cool. OK? It's a history of food from sustainable to suicidal. Interesting which the New York Times called epic and engrossing. Uh, here, here. Bittman spent three decades at the Times, New York Times, where he created The Minimalist, had a five-year stint as the Sunday Magazine's lead food writer, and became the country's first weekly opinion writer at a major publication to concentrate on food. He continues to produce books in the How to Cook Everything series, which everyone on the panel here noted today they, they use religiously. That's great. Uh, and the general cooking Bible, uh, this has been for a quarter century. He has hosted or been featured on four television series, including the Emmy winning Showtime series about climate change, Years of Living Dangerously, and Spain on the Road Again with Gwyneth Paltrow. Bittman was a regular on the Today Show from 2005 to 2010 and still appears occasionally and has been a guest on countless television and radio programs, including Jimmy Kimmel Live, Real Time with Bill Maher, and NPR's All Things Considered, Fresh Air, and Morning Edition. His 2007 TED Talk, What's Wrong with What We Eat, has been viewed five million times. He's a fellow at Yale and is on the faculty of Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. He's a, he has received six James Beers Awards, four IACP Awards, and numerous other honors. Bittman is also the editor-in-chief of the Bittman Project a newsletter and website focusing on all aspects of food, from political to delicious. I like that. He also hosts the podcast Food, which means he never sleeps. <laughs> all right? So, welcome, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, <Brian. laughs> Wow. That was long, I'm sorry. No, no worries, <laughs> no worries. Uh, I have permission to address Betsy as Betsy, who is Elizabeth Colbert. She's been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 1999. Her three-part series on global warming, The Climate of Man, won the 2006 National Magazine Award for Public Interest. She is author of The Prophet of Love and Other Tales of Power and Deceit. Also, field notes from a catastrophe and the sixth extinction, for which she won a Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction in 2015. Her writing on science, nature, and the environment is unparalleled. I can attest to that. Or, as MIT Technology Review put it, if you like your apocalypse with a side of humor, <laughs> Colbert will have you laughing while Rome burns. <laughs> Holy moly. Her new, book, her new book is Under the White Sky, The Nature of the Future which one reviewer described as a book about people trying to solve problems created by people trying to solve problems. Ouch. All right. I don't know where to begin with Simon. <laughs> uh, sort of in awe of the worldview. Uh, so I'm just going to read this and hope that everyone understands who's here. There is more charming, there is no more charming or briskly intelligent writer of history than Simon Winchester. His many books, nearly all New York Times bestsellers, have ranged from The Professor and The Madman, chronicling the creation of the Oxford English Dictionary, to Krakatoa, The Day the World Exploded, to Pacific, the sprawling history of the magnificent sea and his sweeping history of the Atlantic. He carries us through his books with a magic blend of science, geography, adventure, human foibles, and humor. As New York Times wrote, 
He excels at guiding the reader with a contagious sense of wonder. I can attest to that too. This is amazing. In 2006, Winchester was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen. He resides in Western Massachusetts. All right. <laughs> I need to uh, add, put one addenda in these bios. Uh, Elizabeth mentions in here 1816 and froze to death. If you don't know that, you live there. If you live anywhere near here, you experience this and we carry those in our bones. Uh, she may touch on this later. So, without further ado, my comments on this really quickly. Through a brilliant collection of narratives and insights, the authors sitting before us have documented critical events that led to our present environmental crisis. Their threat assessments encompass possible eventualities of future climate change, including the ongoing dissolution of territorial sovereignty and impending political instability. Oh boy. They work in grand scale while detailing potential loss of cultural identity and fold all into compelling narrative of possible challenges to our very survival. They lay the foundations for what is next with persuasive peer review level histories. Each of these authors has his or her unique vision and each offers warnings and hope in equal measure. The realization of hope will require all of us to change our local and world behavior and expectations permanently. Read and reread these books, <laughs> and I mean it. Underscore reread. I learned more the second time than I did the first. This is some of the most exciting reading I've ever done. I'm not saying that because I'm here. It's really true. I'm living this because I farm. Wow. Um, <sighs> Many of our preconceived notions of land and food will blur today, but we will all be better informed at the end. A 60-minute examination of this collection of data interrelationships is daunting for authors and audience, so we will move swiftly, and the panel exchange will be quick. <laughs> we'll offer some time for audience question and answer before we conclude. Without stopping. Hi, Simon. Hello. Simon, I'm so glad you're here. Europeans in the region of what now runs from Maryland to Florida, we were just talking about this a while ago, documented the scale of managed arable land by native people. At first contact, meaning the first time somebody that wasn't native uh, noticed this, native farmland was nearly the same total acreage as lands farmed in this same region today. Could you describe for us parallels between the phenomenon and native lands under high human management at first contact in what we know as Australia today? Then please tell us how colonial imperialism altered that history. And please offer additional and similar insights from other first contact era lands. It sounds like the sort of thing you're asked at a university. <laughs> tutorial. And you have 30 seconds. I know, exactly. <laughs> let, let me first say something which is going to sound awfully pretentious, and maybe Sue Ellen, who introduced us this morning, has already done it. But it's become customary in a lot of institutions these days to offer what's initially called a land acknowledgement before any talk is given. The land acknowledgement, it has various forms, various lengths, this will be very short, but a reminder to all of us that this land here in Martha's Vineyard is actually the ancestral lands of the Wampanoag and we are tourists here. We are newcomers. We are an invasive species, which is, of course, what Betsy here talks about in her book. So I th we must acknowledge this. It is crucially important because these people, much like the aboriginals who Captain Cook came across in Australia in the 1780s and when he met the Maoris in New Zealand, it's all the same. They are the the bearers of the original instructions, if you like. So it's important we acknowledge their existence. Now, I want to make another remark, not totally in line with what you've just asked me. I mean, in, in summary, when Cook arrived in Botany Bay, um, having come from New Zealand, he was astonished to find the, the forest, the woodland in what is now Sydney, had been managed 
much like, as, as Joseph Banks, the great botanist he had on board with him, said, much like an English parkland. Beautiful alleys of trees, areas given over to flowers, areas given over to crops. These people, these Aboriginal people, of the oldest continuous civilization on this planet had managed their land in with the same degree of sophistication as we believe we manage ours today. So it's nothing new. Once again, we should learn from these people. And later on, I dare say, we'll talk about how in the management of fires, we can ma learn from Australian Aboriginals how they manage it, and indeed how the Hawaiians manage it. But we'll get on to that later. What I wanted to say, in largely in deference to, to Mark here, specifically writing about food, the private ownership of land has really all to do with food. And I'm going to take maybe three minutes, if that's all right, to explain why. Um, England, and um, you can possibly tell from my accent, is where I know best of all. Um, in the 14th, 15th centuries, the population was growing rapidly, and the country was not doing terribly well in terms of supplying food to its people because of the existence of what is now known or then known as common land. You have a village and 20 or 30 houses surround a meadow and maybe in turn surrounded by a meadow which can be used by everybody because there was no thought that this land could be privately owned. It was owned by the village. And so the villagers would keep their cattle and their pigs and grow their lettuces and tomatoes and turnips and so forth, all hugga-mugga, all together. And that was fine when the population was relatively small. But once you get pressure, we need more food, someone suddenly realised it is jolly and efficient when the pigs eat the turnips and the cattle <laughs> chomp, chomp, you know, trundle all over the lettuces and so forth. Maybe we ought to enclose these pieces of land, build fences or walls or, or wickets or ha-has, ditches, and make this one, farmer A can have it and he can manage his cattle, farmer B can put his turnips there, farmer C his tomatoes there. And informally, this idea of enclosing land and for it to stop being commonly owned but being privately owned gained traction. It gained traction formally in the year 1604. Oddly enough, in a village called Radipole, very close to a town called Dorchester, where I used to, um, where I went to school when I was at a boarding school, and Radipole, all I remember is you would, did cross-country races through Radipole, a horrible, horrible place, muddy kale fields. And, <laughs> but that was where the first parliamentary ordered enclosure took place. They pinned up the notice on the church door saying, the map of Radipole is going to be henceforth, the common land is going to be enclosed. Anyone that's got an objection, write to Parliament, and not that's going to do any good. And then people will start to own the enclosed pieces of land. This had many effects, one of them being that a lot of people that had hitherto grazed their cattle and grown their turnips and so forth suddenly had nowhere to do it because the land didn't belong to them anymore. And so they were dispossessed. And so they went... Some of them remained disgruntled. Some of them went to the new cities, which, come the Industrial Revolution, 200 years later, accepted, welcomed all sorts of workers. Or they crossed the oceans and went to the newly discovered colonies here, or the colonies in Van Diemen's Land and, uh, and the Antipodes. And the extraordinary thing is that they brought, they brought with them was the idea of private ownership as a possibility. So they landed here, and what did they start doing? Dispossessing people. Dispossessing the people like the Wampanoag who had lived here peaceably and had grown vegetables and planted flowers as Captain Cook discovered in Sydney. So that's all I'm going to say really on this score but it allows Betsy and, and I hope Mark to then take this discussion <laughs> on from there with great respect. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Mark. In keeping with the ideas of land and words that are associated with land, uh, some which maybe carry a pejorative that isn't justified, uh, would you please explain what pleasant, peasant, excuse me, peasant really means and how peasant practices apply to ancient and modern land, farming, food security, 
I know the scope of this is vast, but if you could pick something that makes you comfortable and delve with it as you wish, uh, we'd love to know how you made these connections. You know, I, I think that it's, in, in working on this book, I, I started as a person who was thinking about food and I finished as a person who was thinking about land. And I think land is, I mean, I'm really glad we're here. And I think that this is the right topic. Um, you can tie anything, any issue you want to food, um, but a lot of it is about justice and a lot of justice is about land. And, and Simon started to get into this. It's, it's a big subject, obviously, but determining how land is used and who gets to figure that out is one of the great issues um, that will determine our future. And some of that wisdom maybe much of that wisdom comes from what we don't call peasants, but, but people who tend to call themselves peasants, which, which mean people who, who largely raise food for themselves, for their families, for their towns or villages or regions, um, and who use the kind of techniques uh, that we've managed to unlearn um, and which have led in part to the devastation that that we see both agriculturally and environmentally in general that, that faces us today. So um, I think in part, I mean, in a way it would have been, it would have been great to rehearse this because we, you know, we do have a thread um, from ancient history till now and we, each of the four of us has something different to add to that conversation, but it's not orchestrated, it's not choreographed. And that would be, that would be fun. Um, I do think that we are going uh, that we are going to have to take leadership from people that we that we call or don't call again that we call peasants, um, and that we forego leadership of of people who've who've managed to industrialize food and everything else, and turn it all into a profit center as opposed to a, a system that might nourish us. So. I could go on, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, that's it. You describe how the ancient to modern human reactions and interactions with nature can be reduced to our insistence on conquering, I hate to do that, or fixing the term I came up with to shorten things up in my head, um, fixing or conquering nature. Uh, when the fix fails, we sort of take a mental leap or something and pretend like we didn't already do something and then we fix the fix. And uh, that continues. So uh, following examples in your book, these failures appear and reappear time after time, becoming serially wrong, occasionally tragically funny, maybe in a Greek sense. and finally frightening. Would you please give us examples of these failures and help us understand why we almost never learn lessons about correct response to survival challenges? Uh, maybe a <laughs> departure point would be for this vast canon of things that would take hours. Um, multiple projects that have failed to address the real challenges and catastrophic problems in the Mississippi, Mississippi River system, which by the way, all three authors here have hard views on this that are well-researched on a peer review level. So thanks, go for it. Well, I will, um, I, I just wanna, I'll say two things. And I think that, you know, Mark is right. And there is a thread, as disparate as our books are, there really is a thread uh, that unites them. And I think what the perspective that I came at this problem from um, we know, which is not exactly a food perspective or a land perspective, but fits in very neatly and it doesn't directly address the Mississippi situation, though I'm happy at uh, the, the Louisiana and the Mississippi River um, land loss problem. But maybe I'll take a slightly different tack to sort of give a through line here, and that is the reason that we have a hard time lear learning these things is because we have so fundamentally altered things. So let's let's take our food system. Um, it's estimated that something like uh, three billion people alive today are alive because of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. 
Um, so I don't think we're going back from that. We're not just eliminating, you know, three billion people. Synthetic uh, fertilizers are, are here for the foreseeable future. Now they have, and I'm talking to a farmer here, so I'm sure I'll get some pushback here, perhaps. I don't know. I don't know where you are on synthetic fertilizers, but I'd be very interested to know. Um, you know, tremendous consequences, just phenomenal. Um, so just to give you, you know, one very simple example, a lot of the nitrogen that's applied in the Corn Belt of the U.S. runs down the Mississippi River, uh, where it causes, you know, these blooms in the in the Gulf of Mexico that lead to the anox, the dead zone. It's called the dead zone in the Mississippi, in the Gulf of Mexico. Every year, we get an estimate of how big that is. It's supposed to be shrinking. It is not shrinking um, because of the way we apply uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Now, you know, one simple thing would be to say, let's do it better. And many, many. You know, people have proposed this, and there are. We certainly could be doing it a lot better. Why aren't we? I don't feel, honestly, um, expert enough to say that. But I will just tell you that the result is is the same every year. You know, we get this huge dead zone. Um, another big uh, consequence of applying nitrogen that I think is underappreciated is it, it, it drifts everywhere. We now have completely changed the biosphere because you know, some plants are nitrogen limited and some insects depend on these plants that are nitrogen limited. But once we apply nitrogen everywhere, we, we just totally change the landscape. It's probably true even here on Martha's Vineyard. Um, and so we are favoring, you know, disfavoring certain plants and favoring other plants depending on their uh, affinity for nitrogen or their ability to fix nitrogen. And that has these ripple effects through the biosphere that we're just beginning uh, to think about even. And in fact, it, I'm sure everyone here has, you know, read these pieces about what's happening to insect populations. And there are many theories about why, you know, insecticides are pretty obvious. Uh, culprit, but another potential culprit that people are looking at is nitrogen, because nitrogen has so changed the plant communities and insects that are dependent on certain plants that have, you know, lost this battle <laughs> uh, are obviously also losing the battle. So this is a case, you know, this is a, uh, an example, I think, of something that we did with you know, you can, you can argue about the motives. It's the Haber-Bosch process. It was invented almost exactly a century ago. Uh, it had tremendous consequences and was obviously welcomed as feeding the world, a planet that people thought were not going to be able to feed the world because of nitrogen, were li nitrogen limited. Uh, that has now had all these ripple effects, one of which is a tremendous population that depends on synthetic nitrogen. All of us here are partly made of synthetic nitrogen. So uh, it's very difficult to roll that back. And this is the situation we're in and why we keep applying, in my view, fixes on top of fixes, because it's simply hard, as your population has grown radically since the Haber-Bosch process, uh, more than doubled. Uh, we're about to hit 8 billion people on planet Earth very soon. Uh, it, it's hard to just say, well, let's just go back uh, because, you know, here we are. So that's why, why I think we're in the mess that we're in, or one of the reasons we're in the mess. Excellent. <laughs> um, so, uh, Mark, Betsy, and Simon both weigh in on this on different levels. So, uh, Simon, um, if you would, do you want to extrapolate on this since uh, we're there? And uh, what would you add to the discussion on the mismanagement in chemical uh, horticulture uh, versus <coughs> mismanager of uh, management of hydraulics, which some of the chemical mismanagement has forced the need, obviously, for hydraulic management changes on and on and on. So, and well, well, let me say, I mean, I'm terribly yeah. interested in the hydraulics of the Mississippi. <laughs> um, I know so much less about. Uh, the chemistry, and I'd love to know from Betsy, what is, is there an optimum population size on this planet, do you think? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a question that has been asked of much, you know, greater minds than my own, and um, I think that, uh, you know, Ed, Ed Wilson, I, I'll quote Ed Wilson, I think, would say, you know, the, the, the planet sort of without synthetic nitrogen, without you know, could maybe support two billion people. So we're way, way <laughs> we're way, way over that. Um, and you know, people often, you know, ask me, you know, the 
because I've written a lot about climate change, is there the connection between population and climate change, and there it's very complicated. You know, there's a lot of people on the planet who are contributing very, very little to climate change. There's a lot of us sitting here today who are contributing a lot to climate change. So it's not a strict, you know, one-to-one -one <laughs> ratio by any respect. Um, but, you know, we have to try to solve the problems we have with the population that we have. That's where we are. Uh, I don't think anyone, even the most, you know, radical anti-humanist, which, you know, exist, would say, well, let, let's just do away with six billion people. So we have to try to, you know, solve this problem with, uh, with a still growing population, a population that is expected to grow through the end of the 21st century. Uh, you know, that's sort of barring catastrophe. Um, so I don't, you know, what is the quote unquote carrying capacity of planet Earth? It depends on what we're consuming, obviously. You know, a lot of people consuming a little or, you know, fewer people consuming a lot. So that's a, it's a question that I'm going to duck. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you, you want to jump in on that? Well, I, I, Betsy is right. The population has, as agriculture became more successful, um, and that certainly includes the, the Haber-Bosch process, the invention of, of chemical fertilizer, population grew, and as population grew, we needed to produce more, and as we produced more, more people could survive, and so on. But population is stabilizing. It's growing more slowly, and will continue to grow more slowly. And I, I think, if, I mean, I'm not an expert here, but I think most people agree that 10 billion is kind of where it's going to level off, and part of that is about um, birth control and education of women and girls and, and other things, other good inventions of the 20th century or good developments of the 20th century. Um, so it is true that almost none of us would exist without, without the kind of agriculture that's developed over the last 10,000 years. So the, the population of Earth might, was, was maybe 50 million 10,000 years ago. Um, but we do have to figure out how to, how to make it work. Um, and we haven't really started to do that. Part of that is that we keep doing things wrong. Um, part of it is that we don't have political will. Part of, part of it is that we, we haven't really thought about justice for all of us and how that might work. Um, I don't know whether that's ducking the question or not. I mean, there aren't, there aren't easy answers, but things are going to stabilize. And um, if we look at different and better ways of doing agriculture that are less uh, expensive, ecologically expensive, environmentally expensive, then we may be able to support eight or, or 10 billion people um, in a sustainable, for want of a better term, way. And if we can't, I mean, barring catastrophe is always a phrase <laughs> that, that we wind up using, but if we can't, we'll see what happens, but we should go down fighting. I mean, we should try to do this. We should try to find a way to do agriculture that isn't environmentally destructive, um, that doesn't further climate change. I mean, many estimates say that agriculture is responsible for about 30 percent of greenhouse gas generation. That number, anyone can argue about it. But um, so we just have to try to find a way forward. And is there it, are things we can do. Is it impossible to feed? 10 million people, billion people, without genetically modified grains? Well, genetically modified grains haven't increased yield. So the, the question is really, is it, is it possible to feed 10 billion people without destroying the planet? That's the first question. Whatever it takes to answer that, yes, I'm in favor of. Um, I, don't think, I don't think genetic engineering has, has demonstrated that it's a big part of that picture. If it uh, makes anyone in the immediate area uh, a little bit more comfortable about this, uh, I work with uh, the Ford Rice Geneticists daily on this very topic. And they're looking back at what Simon, Betsy, and Mark have looked at eons ago in high density polyculture. And they're getting yields. Uh, with multiple plants on a land race basis because they don't have time to breed up to confront climate change where land races change on their own, which there'll be a test later is called phenotypic plasticity. Um, that's my next book. Oh, I don't have a book. Uh, <laughs> the, the geneticists I work with started on this in 1984. 
Uh, and there's still part of that barrier where we don't get to talk to them very much about this stuff. Uh, they literally invite me over and do a dump truck of stuff that I walk away from, sort of like these books, and say, okay, there it is, go try it. So that's been going on now for about 15 years, uh, but the same thing that determines sun cycle in Africa, the same thing that defines milpa on this continent, the same thing that involves controlled burn and other cool burn in mm -hmm. Australia, uh, stop and think about it. The highlands of China, they were all on exactly the same growing system with different plants. Africa, China, here, South America, Australia. With those continental separations, they were on the same growing system when this started to go out of hand. And our best geneticists are looking back at that right now. Steve Kresovich is in a three university tier looking at sub-Saharan Africa with sun cycle horticulture. That's their original stuff. So just so you heard it. So um, where are we at time-wise? 10 minutes? 10 minutes till Q&A? Cool. OK, so we continue the lightning round next. Since I wasn't supposed to say anything, I have a big mouth. I apologize. OK. Simon. What's, what's the question? <laughs> there isn't a question. Ah. Continue the thread, since this has worked. Uh, pick a new topic. You've got uh, about three minutes. Well, I mean, OK, I'll talk, talk briefly about, well, let me ask, although I was advised not to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. What do we think about rewilding? Do you think it's a good yeah. thing or a bad thing? It's all in vogue in Britain at the moment. Um, largely due to a couple, Charlie and Isabella Burrell, who own a large castle south of London. They have a three and a half thousand acre former arable farm. Um, it wasn't doing terribly well economically. So they decided to stop everything, reintroduce ancient species and let nature rip, if you like. And it's become extraordinarily diverse and it's now become rather chic to go there and there are glamping sites and uh, you can pay money <laughs> to go and see animals and birds and plants that haven't been around in England for a long time. Equally, this was done in Holland, in southern Holland, about 15 years ago, and it was an unutterable disaster. And the animals were starving and uh, it just yes. didn't, didn't work. So um, wilding is a, is a European thing. Um, does it occur in the United States or Canada? And is it a good or a bad thing? This is to me. I believe it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I have not been to the site in England. I have been to the site in the Netherlands, which is called the Ostvardesplassen, uh, which, which is a wonderful experiment. And I, I won't, it, it's unfortunately too complicated to go into, but it, it, it's fenced in. And it was on some level so successful, the deer multiplied so successfully that they were starving to death because they're, you know, fenced in. And, and this became a huge uh, public outcry to watch these deer just, you know, throw themselves up against the fence and die. Um, now, you know, other people made the point that, you know, that's what happens in nature. You know, there's not enough food, you know, animals starve. Uh, so, you know, I think that the idea of, you know, rewilding, which is very, you know, romantic and I guess, you know, sort of very much, um, you know, to a certain extent, to be honest, what I am somewhat poking fun of um, in my book, <laughs> in my latest book, is, you know, we're not going back. We're not going back to what was in Britain, you know, pre-human. People probably on some level barely even know what was in Britain, you know, pre-human. The climate has changed. Everything's been changed. That doesn't, isn't to say that you couldn't, um, you know, take a plot of land um, and let, you know, s whatever species you bring in interact and, you know, they would evolve and they would have their own interactions and you'd create a new community. And, you could say, well, that's better than, you know, having a sterile, uh, you know, failed farm, <laughs> uh, which you're just, you know, treating with a lot of herbicides and pesticides. And I, I would completely agree with that. 
I think, though, that once again, and I think the Europeans are pretty cognizant of this. You know, you're not rewilding. You're not going back to something. You're going to something new. It might be better than the alternative, but it's not, it's not recovering the past. Now, in the States, people where there is more, or at least we think, I should say we think. I'm not sure if this is true either. We think there, you know, we just have been uh, lighter on the land. The you know, indigenous people were lighter on the land. Now they already, I do want to say, drove a lot of creatures extinct. I mean, there was a big megafauna extinction. There were, you know, there used to be mammoths in North America. There used to be mastodons. There used to be saber-toothed tigers. Why are they not here? Well, one very, very uh, popular, I shouldn't say popular, one pretty widely agreed on theory was, you know, because they were hunted. Uh, so, you know, this, the fauna has changed, and people have talked about, let's bring elephants, you know, to North America, because they're the closest thing we have to mammoths. Let's see what happens. You know, we kind of need those big herbivores. So those are really, you know, those are really interesting uh, debates. But once again, you know, we're not kind of going back, but people do talk about having these big corridors for things to migrate through, and that's a species of rewilding, which I think is, is extremely important because everything right now, all species everywhere are on the move because we're changing the climate. So if, if that counts as rewilding, or I, I don't know, I don't think it would exactly, but I think it's really, really crucial. And you, new communities will evolve. You're not going back, but you are going to let evolution sort of do what it can to get through this very difficult time. Hmm. I mean, I think the the key thing is that we're not going back and that, um, yes, it's great to have wilderness areas. I don't, I don't know how rewilding is different from preserving wilderness, but, but and, and we've seen marine protected areas, that's what they're called, right? That, mm -hmm. that if you just set aside a part of the sea where there's no fishing, then the areas around that part of the sea benefit because there's a place for animals to retreat and and act without human interference. Um, all of that's great, but I, I do think we need to find a way forward to do, to do human-directed agriculture um, that works for all of us and that, and that acknowledges the existence and the value of, of natural capital, of other species, and of, of the land. And we haven't, you know, I said this before, I guess, we haven't, we haven't we, the industrialized world, have not done that. We actually have gone uh, n not backwards in, in the sense of, of back into history, but backwards in the sense of, of, of cultivating life um, or, or valuing life. Uh, I, think that it's, I do think that it's important to note that the kinds of agriculture you, Simon, were talking about, or sorry, Glenn, were talking about 10 minutes ago, five minutes ago, um, what, what we might call peasant agriculture, when you go to those kinds of farms, um, you might think you're in a forest or you, or, you, or you might think you're in a meadow. What you don't think you're in is the kinds of fields that we see in the United States, um, the image that comes to your mind if I say the word Iowa. Um, <laughs> if you go to a milpa in Mexico, you say, where's the farm? And the farm is all around you. And that, that kind of farming in accordance with some rules of nature as opposed to trying to conquer nature, I think is the key <clears throat> to moving forward. I don't know exactly how that is going to happen. I do know what ought to happen in the next five or 10 years. And beyond that, you know, we go back to barring catastrophes. So. <laughs> I remember vividly the first time when I was a correspondent in the States in the 70s during Watergate, I took a holiday and went to Iowa near Ames and stayed with my children in a little family farm, a quarter section, grew corn and soybeans, and uh, Thomas Judge was his name, and um, we learned to drive the combine harvester and had the most wonderful time bringing the harvest in. Well, my wife Setsko and I went there two or three years ago, driving across the country, stopped in to find the judges, and yes, they're still there, about 40 years older, but no longer, they still own their house, but they live in the middle of a 15,000 acre industrial farm owned by Cargill or one of the big grain merchants. And they, the, the soul they felt had completely gone out of farming. Everything is industrial. No 
care and attention to the land itself. Everything you two are talking about um, vividly. I'm sorry, I shouldn't go it's on. It's all right. No, but it's great. something I remember vividly and felt so sad for them that what they had hoped for in the 50s, 60s and 70s had, because of industry, because of GMO, because of the rising population, um, had just withered away. It was no, pos no longer possible to make a living there anyway, in a small family farm. And to underscore that, uh, John Deere Finance is the largest debt holder in the American South. And uh, for our farms, uh, we're requiring them to farm debt free. And so we prepay. And we're looking for more adoptive. We're over 100 farms now on that model, but it's nothing compared to what's going on out there. So, QA, where are the microphones? Okay, we, they're standing up in the aisles right there. We wish you, if you have a question, please come to the microphone and ask. Should I start? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And Betsy, I want to thank you for all your work on climate over these many years. I'm Lori David, and I work on these issues as well. Um, my question is really for the panel, but I know Mark deals with this in his incredible book. Um, what, what we have done over the years to crush dissuade and destroy black farmers in this country. And I'm wondering um, your thoughts on what kind of reparations should we be discussing and considering as it relates to that topic. Thank you. I mean, I would like to answer that if it's okay. Um, when we talk about land, I think we are talking about justice. And when we are talking about justice, we are talking about about making good on on what we've done in this country in the last 500 or whatever you want to say years, um, first to indigenous people and then to um, African Americans. It's a long, sad story, of course, but the but the um, I think the simple answer to Lori's question is a, is a term that that people were afraid to utter until recently, and that is land reform. Um, and I, I think that um, 10 years ago, it was, it was hard to have a conversation about reparations without getting screamed at. And now you can have that conversation. And five years ago, you couldn't utter the term land reform without getting laughed at. But now I think it's a legitimate time for this, for this conversation. And, and um, I know that many people here have th thought about this and talked about this. There's no easy solution because we're obviously not about to go down to Congress and pass um, laws giving land back to indigenous people or the descendants of, of enslaved people. Um, but that is the direction that we have to move in. I think that's the, I think that's the right answer to Lori's question is that ultimately um, we need to find a way to distribute land that is not only fair and just for existing populations, but fair and just for past populations to the descendants of past populations. And, and um, you know, until we do that, we're not talking about having a just and fair society. Laurie, I'm there with you, uh, having <clears throat> been the white guy that said reparations and high on the hog. Uh, I can tell you I've had thousands of responses worldwide, um, and we're promoting that. We don't own anything in our system. And we're making sure that the communities have sovereignty. And we also do something that is more important than that, which is called the Nagoya Protocol, which gives genetic sovereignty back to the origins of the genetics we're using, no matter what they're applied to. Uh, so there's some serious high thinking uh, that, again, hasn't trickled down. I was shocked. I was, for us, it's just normal. We talk about, of course, this is in our land. And of course, you own it. Uh, and so that is actually happening uh, point blank. People have flocked to the Sea Islands and the Carolinas in order to return land. And Pat Conroy actually started that. That's back in the 80s, too. So uh, there is hope. And that was excellent, Mark. I think, I think it's worth looking also at New Zealand where there's a very energetic, vibrant movement of land reform giving land back to the Maoris from whom we, the colonialists, stole it in 1840 at the Treaty of Waitangi, where basically, I mean, you remember the cliche about they came, 
with their Bibles. And we had the land. They gave us the Bible. We closed our eyes, said our prayers. Then we had the Bibles and they had the land. Well, that happened in New Zealand. And um, now, slowly, thanks to an extraordinary woman, a militant woman who led marches at the age of 85 from the northern tip of North Island down to the parliament in Wellington, galvanizing the Maori population to change legislation to set up the, um, the Waitangi Tribunal and various other bodies which are bent on giving sovereignty back. It's happening very slowly. It's an extremely complicated legal uh, thing to occur, but it is happening. And I think anyone interested in serious land reform, the kind that, as Mark said, this country badly needs to talk about, mm. should look at what's going on in New Zealand. Kay's brother has worked on that project. He lives in Australia. So, yeah, it's pretty amazing, really amazing. Um, are we, we have five? Great. Any more questions? Hi. Hi, go. Hi. Um, are, is any of you familiar with biochar? And it's used not only as a carbon sequesterer, but a soil amendment. And if so, is that practically scalable? <clears throat> not really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to speak for anyone else. <laughs> well, actually, well, can, can I give a lecture on biochar for I a mean, moment? I yes, please. Please. I mean, please. my wife is Japanese American. She's sitting here. And we'd love to be able to talk about Japanese farmers in the West Coast, but that's what they did and what happened to them in the 1940s is another story. Oh, but yeah. the, the, what's called binchotang, which is effectively charcoal, which is sort of uber charcoal, um, which you go to any um, high-end, uh, what kind of a restaurant? Yakitori restaurant uses strips of this um, bin tang brought from southern Japan um, because it burns smokelessly for hours and hours and radiates in intense heat. This is made scalably in southern Japan. Huge operations. I mean, they're much smaller than they used to be, but you pile basically, um, basically white oak, you set fire to it, you burn it until you can smell acetic acid in the vinegar. Then you haul out these red hot logs, cover them with sand, and after a while they will turn into bincho tang, which is just like if you hit it with a metal bar, it'll sound like it'll sound, it'll ring metallically. It's a remarkable substance. That's what biochar is. But in, in in Japan, which is in my way of thinking the font of much agricultural wisdom. It was scalable, could be here. We briefly thought, we live in the Berkshires, of setting up the BBC, the Berkshire Bincho Tang Company. <laughs> but un unfortunately, the town fire marshal... <laughs> what? It's so labor-intensive. It's terribly labor-intensive. And was, also... It was huge during the Edo period. Yeah. We wanted to, but the town cool. fire marshal took a rather dim view. <laughs> well, we have reached the end. Um, I, w I want to thank Betsy, Mark, Simon. This has been extraordinary. Thank you for putting up with me. And thank you all for listening. Enjoy. Enjoy.